Infectious Disease, Bloodborne Pathogens, and Universal Precautions. When we talk about universal precautions, it's important to understand that all body fluids could potentially be infected with bloodborne pathogens. Body fluids include blood, semen, vaginal secretions, synovial fluid, amniotic fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, pleural fluid, peritoneal fluid, and pericardial fluid. As a healthcare provider, when you come into contact with these bodily fluids, it is important to use universal precautions, which means that we prepare for those fluids to be infected regardless of the individual. Body fluids that may cause infection include feces, nasal secretions, urine, vomitus, perspiration, sputum, and saliva. The chances of contracting a bloodborne pathogen from these fluids is much decreased from the other bodily fluids that were on the previous slide. However, we still need to be cautious, and we may don personal protective equipment when we're dealing with these body fluids as well. HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C infect people of all ages, socioeconomic classes, races, and background. This means that you cannot identify every patient who may transmit an infection. Universal Precautions resolves this uncertainty by requiring you to treat all human blood and bodily fluids as if they were known to be infected. Bloodborne Pathogens in Athletics Although the risk for HIV transmission in athletics is minimal, the following classifications of sports indicate risks relative to one another. The highest risk sports include boxing, martial arts, wrestling, and rugby. Moderate risk sports include basketball, field hockey, football, ice hockey, judo, soccer, and team handball. Lowest risk sports include archery, badminton, baseball, bowling, canoeing or kayaking, cycling, diving, equestrianism, fencing, figure skating, gymnastics, pentathlon, racquetball, rowing, shooting, softball, skiing, swimming, tennis, volleyball, water polo, weightlifting, and yachting. In 1991, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, established standards for an employer to follow that govern occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Programs must develop an exposure plan including counseling, education, volunteer testing, and the management of bodily fluids. Reducing your risk. There are five major tactics to help reduce your risk of exposure and infection. One, workplace practices in personal hygiene. Two, personal protective equipment. Three, engineering controls. Four, good housekeeping. And five, the hepatitis B vaccine. Let's go through each one of these real quick. Work practices. If you come into contact with infectious materials, wash the exposed area immediately in order to lessen the chance of becoming infected. In clinical and patient care areas, you should wash your hands frequently with soap and water, including when you remove your gloves, when you come into contact with blood or other bodily fluids, when you change workstations, or when you enter a clean area. To avoid needle sticks, Never bend, break, or recap needles. Do not remove contaminated needles from a blood tube following a blood draw. And place all contaminated sharps or use sharps in an appropriate puncture-resistant container. Sharps Disposal Containers Sharps Disposal Containers should be functional. They need to be durable, closable, leak and puncture resistant. They need to be accessible. They need to be close to where the work is being done. Visible. They need to be properly labeled and color-coded. Most of these disposal containers are either red or orange and have appropriate marking. They need to be accommodating. They should be conveniently located and easy to reach with an opening large enough for the sharp material. Personal hygiene. Other precautions to protect yourself include Always minimize splashing, spraying, and splattering when you can. Do not eat, drink, smoke, 
apply cosmetics, or handle contact lenses where you may be potentially exposed to infectious materials. Do not store food or drinks where blood and other infectious materials may be present. Avoid petroleum-based lubricants because they can eat away at latex gloves. Hand cream is okay, but only after you have thoroughly washed your hands. Personal Protective Equipment Personal protective equipment, also known as PPEs, protect you from contact with potentially infectious materials. PPEs may include masks or eye protection. It is important to use masks or eye protection when you perform procedures likely to generate splashes of blood or other bodily fluids. Gowns or coats. These are used for procedures likely to generate splashes of blood or other bodily fluids as well. Gloves should always be used before touching or if likely to come in contact with blood, bodily fluids, non-intact skin, mucous membranes, and when performing venipuncture. Here are some examples of PPEs. It is important that you understand that there's a right PPE for some of the jobs. Think about this from a clinical standpoint. What's wrong with this picture? Have we used the correct PPEs? What about this picture? Is this any better? I see one glove, but where's the other one? Gloves. Gloves are a very important way of protecting yourself. Always use latex or approved non-latex gloves. Always check the gloves for holes before putting them on. There are also specific rules to be followed for glove removal. With both hands gloved, peel one glove off from the wrist to the fingers and hold it in the gloved hand. With the exposed hand, peel the second glove from the inside, tucking the first glove into the second. Immediately dispose of both gloves in a biohazardous materials container, and then wash your hands thoroughly. Gloves must be changed after contact with each procedure and disposed of in the appropriate biohazard container. This also applies in the event of a defective, ripped, or torn glove. Any cut, laceration, abrasion, or cracked or damaged skin on the clinician should be covered with the appropriate bandage prior to treating patients. Gloves are not a substitute for hand washing, so it's important to wash our hands. Hands should be washed in soap and water for a period of 30 seconds. Warm water tends to work the best. Disposable towelettes or instant hand sanitizing lotions should be used if access to soap and water is not immediately available. For example, out on an athletic field. Hands should be washed as soon as access to soap and water is possible. We can fight germs by washing our hands. It is important to wet your hands. Use soap. Lather and scrub for 20 to 30 seconds. Make sure to get underneath the fingernails, between the fingers, and the tops or the backs of your hands. Rinse for another 10 to 15 seconds. Turn off the tap and dry your hands. Engineering controls are the primary means of minimizing or eliminating employee exposure to bloodborne pathogens and include the use of safer medical devices. Some examples are self-sheathing needles, sharps disposal containers, biohazard waste bags, biological safety hoods, and autoclaves. Good housekeeping means using your common sense and knowledge to keep your work areas clean and protect yourself and your colleagues. Some general rules are to clean and decontaminate all equipment and surfaces at the end of each day, or the use depending on an appropriate decontaminant. Replace protective coverings on equipment. Place contaminated sharps into proper leak-proof containers. Please read and follow all biohazard labels. Always dispose of hazardous material, including sharps, in the proper red container or bag. The Hepatitis B Vaccination The vaccination is administered in three-part injection, one typically at employment orientation, one at three months, and the final one at six months. A post-vaccination serology test, or a titer, should be scheduled to check the antibody levels. All three injections must be received for the vaccination to be effective. 
today's vaccines are safe and are 85 to 97 percent effective. An exposure incident procedure. An exposure incident is a spill, splash, needle stick, ingestion, or accident in which you have direct and unprotected contact with human blood, fluids, or tissues. In the event of an exposure incident, an employee should wash the hands or flush the area immediately. Notify their supervisor. Seek further medical treatment as necessary and ensure the incident is reported to the employer. It is important to report an exposure incident as soon as possible. Most businesses have a practice that you have to report within a 24-hour period. Laundry. Towels or other linens contaminated should be bagged and separated from other laundry. Contaminated laundry should be washed in hot water, 159 degrees Fahrenheit, for at least 25 minutes, using a detergent that deactivates the virus or blood. Gloves must be worn during bagging and cleaning of contaminated laundry. How should a situation like this be handled? This is a picture of Kurt Schilling pitching in the 2004 World Series. He had surgery to repair a ruptured perineal tendon sheath several days before this picture was taken. He was actively bleeding on the mound and kept touching his actively bleeding ankle before throwing the ball. What's the potential contamination? Kind of makes you think. Here's our critical thinking question for this chapter. Please answer this question as part of your assignment for this unit. You have an athlete who was going up for a rebound in a pickup basketball game when she was elbowed in the face and started bleeding above her eye. Answer the following questions. What are universal precautions? What personal protective equipment should be used when treating this individual? How should bloody gauze be disposed of? If you found out that there was a rip in your glove following the treatment of your athlete and you had a scrape on your hand, would you be concerned about contracting a bloodborne pathogen? Would that change if you knew that this patient was HIV positive?